Well, hello to you all. Um, <clears throat> I want, what I'd like to do with you this morning is just share some reflections that have come out of, I guess, around 45 years of working in the initially medical, then psychiatric, as a psychiatrist, and then as a counselor and uh, a teacher of counseling at Covenant Seminary in the States. Um, and, and, I, and people sometimes ask, what is Christian counseling? And I'm going to give you a framework that, has, that I have found really helpful, that I use with my students. It's sort of divided into stages, and we'll cover a little bit of the ground that Pablo has already covered uh, first thing this morning. And I think it's relevant for professional counselors and pastoral counselors, but particularly pastoral counselors who are working so often in Christi overtly Christian contexts. Many counsel Christian counselors are working with a lot of non-Christian clients as well. So I have to speak about it slightly differently with them. And my teachers have not only been uh, you know, in the secular therapy world and the Christian counseling world, but also uh, my family who teach me the most about life. So I have four kids, four grown-up kids, and I have nine grandkids. And um, I've just come from them in England, uh, and it was really refreshing. My wife was here last year. This is her being a grandmother over here on the left, but sadly she's not here with us this year. So the first question when we sit down in front of someone comes to see us, maybe to ask for help, uh, and the question is, is who is this person? And I've underlined person because, first of all, we need to have an idea of who people are. Because the big question of life is, why are we here? And what is life about? And um, is there a God? And what problems do we have? And how can we fix those problems? Those are the big questions we all face, aren't they? And each of the secular therapies has come up with a particular answer to that question. So if you put each of the secular therapies as a lens, looking at people to ask the question of who is a person, and this is a whole lecture on its own that I'm just going to give you a taste of. If you think of each of the, the lenses, so back in the early 1900s <clears throat> with Freud, the Freudian lens, looking at people, and Freud thought he knew who people were by observing them. Uh, and then he prescribed psychoanalysis as a treatment for them, and he had a goal for who people should become, how they could fix their unhappiness and make, it, make themselves a little more happy. The humanists later in the 1950s with Carl Rogers and others had a much more optimistic view of human nature. And for, Carl Rogers comes up with his view of who people are and what's gone wrong and how they can be fixed. And so you could go round with each of the therapies, and there are more circles than these, quite a lot more now, uh, but the medical model, the primary sort of, you know, you need antidepressants for your depression or anti-anxiety drugs, the behavioral model that sees us as stimulus response machines. Now, the reason I put this square here, actually if I can go to the next one here, if you pull this diagram out towards you in three dimensions and imagine square lenses, <laughs> okay, we have not only circular lenses, we also have square lenses. If you're a believer, you look primarily at the world through biblical revelation, yeah, through what we sometimes call special revelation. This is, this is what we believe is true that informs us about the nature of the world. So through that that front lens, the smallest square, you see all these other circles of secular knowledge, of behaviorism and Freudianism. And as Christians, we can say each of those people, because they're made in the image of God, has discovered things that are really true about who we are as people. But they're also very confused about how to make sense of that. So it's a mixture of truth and falsehood. And in the, the, the true bits, so here we go back to this, what I would call general revelation. So men and women, even without 
the Bible can discover things that are true about the world that we live in. Paul says this in Romans. He says we can, we can infer that there is a creator and something of his character. So there are things in each of these circles I would contend are what I would call common grace wisdom or general revelation that we may be able to use as Christians. But we need incredible careful discernment. So if you, for example, you take the behavioral circle, I would profoundly disagree with the behaviorists on seeing people as stimulus response machines or animals. But I use their systems of desensitization to help people when they have problems with phobias or with obsessive compulsive disorder or something like that. So we don't find particular treatments for extreme fears like PTSD or phobias in scripture, but we do find general principles about anxiety in scripture. And I'll be doing a workshop on anxiety, uh, a sort of continuous one Monday and Wednesday afternoons where we can explore that a bit more. <clears throat> But our task as Christians in the world of psychology and counseling is to look at the part of our task is to look at these secular therapies and say, where do we have common ground and difference in terms of their assumptions and their goals and their techniques? I'm going to be looking in the professional counseling network at mindfulness. And mindfulness is a thing that's sort of swept over our culture. And we're going to be asking what is true about mindfulness and the techniques of emotional regulation that come out of that, that fits the world God has made, and what parts of it take you into very deceptive beliefs, which are much more akin to a Buddhist philosophy of life. So we're, we're, we're practicing that art of discernment in that. So we as Christians, though, are beginning with Scripture, and you as if you're pastors and working in the church, obviously that will be the place that you will focus most in teaching people truth. So I want to draw out in this, and, and, and before I get to the drawing out bit there, that the rest of the world has thrown out revelation, and they are relying only on reason and speculation, right? So there's, th th there's, there's no trust in Scripture anymore. So they're just saying, we can get by on our own. Science and reason will help us. And science and reason are, are good, provided they're used within this framework and always critiqued by a biblical view of life. So that being said, that my understanding of who people are comes from a biblical framework of, and this is the big story that we believe is true. All the other secular therapies have another story about what's true about human beings and what's gone wrong and what their problems are. Creation, fall, redemption, and future glory. And we'll touch on each of these as we go through. And as we look at people in general, Every person in this room, every person that comes to you for help is a mixture of glory and grief. Yeah? In a fallen world, we all have remnants of the image of God which are beautiful and have incredible dignity. So we, we might use the words dignity and depravity. And by depravity, I mean not just willful rebellion and sin, which we all have, but I mean all the effects of sin that have come down to us from the sin of Adam and Eve, the consequences of the fall, your parents' sin, your culture's sin, everything that shapes your mind and your heart that you didn't choose, but then you have your, your own depravity in responding to all of that. And then the, the third sort of pair that I find really helpful in thinking about people, here is someone sitting in front of me who has great beauty and great brokenness. 
And I want in my counseling, in my care for them, to be in touch with and to help them to know better each of these pairs, their glory, their dignity, their beauty, and yet also their grief and depravity and brokenness. So then, having, having, having that in my mind as I sit with someone, then I have to ask, who is this individual person that I'm sitting with here? And you probably know this, you may have referred to it already this morning, but this well-known verse, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, and how does that go on? This, this verse should be tattooed on your heart. Any of you know? <clears throat> I'll give it to you. <laughs> a man, or we might say a woman too, of understanding draws them out. That is our, our task, isn't it? Is drawing out the hidden motives of the heart, the purposes. Because they're difficult. We don't know ourselves very well. And in counseling, we often... I, I sometimes think when, uh, when I'm listening to a sermon in church, I think it would be great if the preacher or some of his elders could go around the whole church this afternoon and ask each person what they got from that sermon and how it applies to them. And each person would be different, wouldn't they? Because each has their own story. And one of the, one of the privileges of counseling is you get to sit and work with people in depth. You're not just scattering the word out to the congregation. You're applying it to each person's heart and mind. So it, it had happened that most of the themes that I came up with start with the letter D. So for convenience and memory, I talk about it. It's nothing musical in this. I'm not going to do an operatic version of this. But um, So let me give you the, the six Ds that, that, I, that I think about. The first is drawing out the story, discovering dignity and depravity, and I'm going to go through each of these in some detail, discerning damage, uh, <clears throat> delighting in and dreaming, uh, disturbing and disrupting, and drawing and directing. So I'll, I'll, you'll get each of these, and I think you have the headings in the notes. So the, the drawing out the story bit <clears throat> is what I think you have begun to talk about in talking about a first session in counseling. You are exploring the problem, and very often when someone comes with a problem and you ask them, tell me what it is you're hoping that I will be able to help you with, or what do you hope that to get out of this, uh, our session to, uh, talking together. Uh, and then I will say to them after they've told me that, I'll say just, if we can hold that and we'll come back to it, tell me just a little more about, I'd love to know a little more about your life so that I can put this problem you're coming with in the context of what has shaped to you to be the person you are. So then I might ask them about their family and uh, their background and learning to listen deeply and well. And listening, as you may have heard this morning, is a, in, in our normal day-to-day -day conversations, it's sort of to and fro, back and forth, and we do as much talking as listening usually. But listening deeply and passionately for 50 minutes or an hour is, is, can be exhausting because you are really trying to understand this person. So you need to have a deep curiosity about people. If you don't have curiosity about people, you shouldn't be in the business of counseling and pastoring. <clears throat> so here's another thing to be tattooed on your heart. He who answers before listening, do you know the other side of that one? Did you do this this morning? That is his folly and his shame. That's strong words, isn't it? Folly and shame. So learning to listen well before you give an answer. And mo most of us have a sort of instinctual fix-it mentality where someone starts to tell us a problem and we begin to give solutions. 
Um, but we need to know more, and the context of storytelling is that you provide a place of safety, a relationship of safety. People are often coming from situations where they have not been able to trust people very much. And why should they trust you? Why should you t they tell you their story? So you have to create a place where they experience you as a safe person. And for some, that will take several meetings before they feel safe enough. Others will, it will be much easier for them. But to, to, to have some sort of warmth, to be able to uh, smile on them, to maintain some level of eye contact, not too much, because that can be threatening, but not just looking all around the room. Um, and then empathy of, of really listening to their stories and putting in your own words what you are hearing them say and what they are feeling and thinking and accepting them. And in that, you are modeling something of God's grace, accepting them messy as their life is, messy as their story is. You just love them with all the mess hanging out. Um, and, and a degree of honesty that you're not going to be uh, duplicitous or deceptive with them. And I find it really helpful, something that helps safety is having a consistent same place to meet. So I will meet you at 11 o'clock and we'll meet for an hour on Tuesday mornings and it, it'll be here in my office. Um, and that in itself provides a certain sense of, of safety. If you're meeting in all sorts of different places and random times, it's confusing and it's upsetting to a number of people. So you are, in this way, being a minister, as Jesus was for us, of grace and truth, of accepting them, but also helping them towards the truth about life. <clears throat> so you listen, you explore, you listen deeply and well, and you ask careful questions. And I will come back to this theme of questions a little later, but you're asking who and what has shaped this person to be who they are today. And as you listen, some people are really good at listening, and they don't need a whole lot of training. It's just part of their life and their background. Others don't know how to listen and probably shouldn't be doing counseling. And there are a lot of us who need help learning to listen well. And, and sometimes I think of it like whether you're musical or not. Some people can hear the four parts of a harmony the soprano and the alto and the tenor and the bass. And they can hear it easily and they can sing it easily. Most of us have to be trained to hear it and to sing it. And some of us are musically deaf, <laughs> tone deaf. So it's much harder. And I think part of the, what we're doing in listening, we're listening to people's words and we're listening also to their emotions. And sometimes their words are saying one thing and their emotions are saying another, and their body is telling us something else. Often it's more in tune with the emotions. And not only do you have to listen to these different aspects of how they are communicating, and, and this is a skill you learn to notice people's eyes, to, to notice expressions, to notice tension in hands and body. Um, and it often helps you to get into the story more if you might even comment. You know, I hear, I noticed when you were telling me that story that your eyes were getting a little moist. And I'm wondering if that's a really painful place for you. That's a sort of, you're going a little deeper. You, you're listening to every part of their language. And then at the same time, you're listening to yourself. So it gets a bit complicated. It's like learning to ride a bike or drive a car when you're doing several things at once. And, and, you, and you need to be knowing how much of your story is actually reacting to their story. So if you have experienced a, a very critical father or abuse or something like that, and the person is telling you their story of that, it may trigger things in you 
that may interfere with the process of, of counseling. So that's the drawing out the story bit. Then moving on, and, and each of these stages does not happen necessarily in this order neatly. It, they may be woven together. As I hear someone's story, I'm already some, discovering something about their dignity and their depravity. So I had a, a client came very caught in sexual addiction, in pornography. Um, and as I listened to his story, that's all he told me. But as I heard the context of the bigger story, I heard that he was an incredibly gifted musician, a concert musician. And he had uh, three beautiful children and I discovered from his wife later that he was actually a very good father with his kids. Something of his dignity was in that part of the story that I hadn't discovered at the beginning. So listening to the stories enables you to see this. And as you do that, you're also moving into the third stage of this of discerning damage. And I've added and disintegration, because if you think that when God created Adam and Eve, there was perfect harmony in the world, wasn't there? There was no disintegration. After the fall, our emotions, our thinking, our bodies, bodily reactions, um, our relationships, they're all disintegrated. They're not working as they should. And a lot of what we're doing in counseling is helping people to become who they were intended to be, to be reintegrated. So, in exploring the heart, which is part of discerning and uh, dignity and depravity and some of the damage, we're listening to stories of desires in the heart. And we're trying to help people to understand what is a good God-given desire <clears throat> and a sinful desire. So it might be a desire for a particular, and, and, and often that takes you into dreams, the desires and dreams of the heart that we've dreamt of always having a particular career. And we've been thwarted in that, not able to do it. Um, <clears throat> and our family has suffered because of it. <clears throat> um, so there are good dreams of wanting to be productive, to have a good career, to use our gifts but very easily it turns into dreaming more sinfully so that some of the things we dream of having become more like idols in our minds. <clears throat> and we often have disappointments uh, and frustrations in life and the damage of other people's sins against us and abuse um, and other people deceiving us. If you've grown up with an alcoholic father or mother, you live in a web of deception and lies. And it's part of your reality as a child or as, or as a teenager. And it may have driven you down into the depths of perhaps addiction or despair and depression. Um, so you'll hear all sorts of stories of brokenness. Um, and you are exploring those and the effect and something of where those things have come from in the person's heart. And as you do that, you, you enter with them, I think, into God's grief over the world. But we, in being made in the image of God, need to reflect something of his character. And we read in Genesis 6 that the Lord was grieved and his heart was filled with pain, as one translation puts it, over the, the sin and the brokenness of the world. And we need to reflect something of that uh, suffering of God. I, um, I would strongly recommend this book to you, Diane Langberg's book, Suffering and the Heart of God. Um, she writes with great passion. She writes with great experience of working all over the world with people groups who have been horribly abused. Um, and she draws in how important it is for us to have the heart of God towards these people so that we learn to, to weep with those who weep. And I think so often I find in counseling anyway that, 
the sort of the, f the first stages of counseling after finding out about the story and learning about the story are much to do with grief, of empathizing with the hurt that people come with and, in, and, and enabling them, giving them permission to say, that was really evil, what that person did. That was really wrong. That, that really hurt me, damaged me. To enable them to to weep. So we enter their groaning. I often say to my counseling students, you have to learn in this business of counseling to be a good groaner. You're going to be groaning with God and the whole creation over all the brokenness that there is there. As Camus says, if God is in heaven, how can there be so much groaning on earth? And many of our, the people who come to us are asking that very question. How can there be a good God if he has allowed these awful things to happen to me, to my family, to this world. And, and we, we, we ourselves, and we need to help them to, to groan with the psalmists and with the prophets, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to leave this world in this mess? When are you going to come back? <clears throat> I love Haim Potok's uh, words, I need a son who can carry pain not just a large brain, but a large heart. And many pastors have big brains, PhDs, lots of academic training, biblical knowledge, but they have small hearts and they need development of both. So we enter with the whole creation, with God, into this groaning, as Paul says in Romans 8. Dan Allender puts it well, and he says that in counseling, often we're hearing stories and we're moving in those stories in a certain direction. There's stories where people have suffered profoundly, and yet they are learning to sing with the deepest strains of sorrow and the most haunting melodies of hope. Remember how Paul talks about us being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. It's not all sorrow, it's not all rejoicing. There's both, and they're woven together in, in our experience. <clears throat> so as, as we get into this, we, we, the other sort of pairing, which doesn't begin with D, <laughs> is, is the, the, the sinned against and sinner. As you listen to people's stories, you hear the stories of how they've been sinned against but then you have to help them to ask the question of how have I responded to hurt and betrayal and being sinned against? And then you begin to hear stories of anger and bitterness and people staying in bitterness for a very long time, not being able to forgive. You hear stories of people numbing themselves and becoming hard to God, to relationships, to, to emotions. Um, <clears throat> and they become stoic and they just go through life cut off from the reality inside them. Or they may react and become cynical about everything in life. That's a common response to hurt and betrayal. And obviously, uh, uh, and some will go on into self-pity and, and maybe into depression. And we are hoping that in our helping them to tell their stories and reflecting on them with them, that we can help them to tease out what is being sinned against, what is righteous anger, and where they should be sorrowing and grieving over the way they've been sinned against, and then move them towards the process of forgiveness and love, of repentance and forgiveness and love for their own sin in reaction to the ways they've been sinned against. So Dan Allender again says, God promises us redemption, but his sacred path leads us away from safety and predictability and comfort. And as we'll see in a minute, God and we sometimes are called to disrupt people's lives, to disturb them, to make them uncomfortable, to, to in a sense make things worse before they get better in order to break through the hardness of heart, the stoicism, the cynicism, the self-pity that they have fallen into. 
So in thinking about who we are as people, um, Mike Emlett in his little book Crosstalk, which is sort of looking at how we use the scriptures in counseling, um, defines uh, who we are in three ways. He talks about us as being saints and sufferers and sinners. So this is looking at the person who you're counseling. Are they, obviously if they're a believer, their primary identity is as a child of God in union with Christ. And they are also a sufferer because they live in a sinful, broken world, and they are a sinner. I, I was groping around. There was something that wasn't quite enough for me in this because I said I counsel quite a lot of non-Christians, and I don't see them as saints yet. I hope they will become one in the kingdom of God, but they are, in God's view, profoundly significant. So I added the significance to the other three S's. Because when we counsel non-Christians, we obviously are wanting to treat them with the attitude with which God see, see them, with the way God sees them as profoundly significant. They also are sinners and sufferers. And we hope to move them, help them to move towards entering the kingdom of God. So moving on through these stages then, the, the, the fourth then is delight in and dream. It may seem a little odd that you should be dreamy in your counseling and pastoral care of people. But what I mean by this is, is going for the glory, is looking for the dignity. People come with the depravity, the brokenness, the grief. And we want to help them also to be in touch with who God has made them to be, their giftedness, their significance, like this young man with the pornography addiction. And, and yet also to be able to delight in the way that God has made him, given him this musical gift and the sensitivity to people and to his children, and to give him hope that one day he can push back against the brokenness of his sexual addiction. So we're, we're trying to give people glimpses of the possibilities of the glory and dignity and beauty which God, with which God has made them. <clears throat> And, and so we ask, what in, as I think about this person, what does God really desire for this person? How can I, in my own mind, and maybe little by little share with them, how they might use their gifts to the glory of God and to push back against the, the depravity? And it's a sort of reframing, helping them now not to see themselves as despicable and worthless, and beyond redemption, but rather to be able to see there are things, there are remnants of the image of God in you that God wants, and God wants to redeem the whole of you. Pablo reminded us last night of Francis Schaeffer's phrase about people in a fallen world, that we are glorious ruins. And you in Europe know a lot more about glorious ruins than we in America do. You have castles and palaces going back for centuries that lie, some of them lie in ruin. Some of them have been beautifully re restored. And as I walk around some of these ruins with my kids and grandkids, we sort of play the game of imagining knights in armor and great feasts and um, the sort of the dignity of this beautiful building being uh, be, being as it was when it, in the beginning. And just recently I've been in some most magnificent cathedrals in England, just places like Lincoln Cathedral here. Imagine this place as a ruin and then being restored to its former glory. So think of people like that. We're all glorious ruins. And God is in the work of restoring us, and one day will make us completely restored again. We have a, a, a place to walk some of that journey of restoration, can be instruments in God's hands to, in that process of redemption and restoration. <clears throat> and then the, the next one, uh, the fifth one here, is this theme of disturb and disrupt. <clears throat> 
So in a way, you have to earn the right to move into disturbing and disrupting. As you get to know people, as you earn their trust, as you hear their stories, as you've entered into their grief, then you begin also to think about ways in which God wants to transform. So God, we know that God accepts us, loves us in His grace with all our imperfections, but He doesn't want to just, us just to settle, to stay the same. And that's our attitude in relation to people we may counsel. So, in biblical and psychological areas, we are disturbing and disrupting all sorts of aspects of people's lives. Their sinful desires, their wrong dreams, their maybe their uh, perfectionist all-or-nothing thought patterns, um, their emotional patterns of extreme reactivity and, uh, and explosiveness when they are angry or not being able to show anger at all. Uh, maybe their styles of relationship which are really unhealthy. And so we could go on. There's, th th these are many areas and um, you're, you're disturbing their depravity, their sinful nature. And you may even be disturbing places where there are demonic footholds in their lives. Allender puts it well when he says, my calling in counseling is to intrigue, to disrupt, and to invite the other person to consider their own heart. I love that. So just giving you an example of this, disturbing and disrupting thinking and feelings. This may be where you are exposing lies in the way people believe. People feel that they are utterly worthless and useless because they've been told that all their lives by perhaps critical parents uh, and others in their lives. So it's, they've heard it for 35 years and you begin to suggest to them there may be another way of thinking about themselves. Or someone, I have a client who's very perfectionist and she's always thinks in very all or nothing terms. And over the months and years that I've seen her intermittently, Sometimes when she sits down, she begins telling me about something that's happened, and her reactions to it. And I would just say to her, did you hear what you just said? She stops, she pauses, she smiles wryly, and she says, uh-uh, there I go again, my all or nothing thinking. That's just a little disruption, disruptive comment that undermines. So, so part of this is helping people's minds to be renewed. Think of, of learning emotional regulation. Hopefully, good parents teach their children as they mature, as their brains develop, to talk about what it is they're feeling, not just to react and explode and have temper tantrums and so on. Um, that would leave them very immature. Sadly, there are a lot of people in our world who have never learned emotional regulation. And they need help. They need their minds, their brains retrained. And we can help them to do that. One of the benefits of mindfulness techniques is in helping people to stop, slow down, look at what they're thinking and feeling, and then choose a different way of reacting. So a lot of what we do, and it's intriguing to me that a lot of the current neuroscience is talking about us being able to retrain our brains. And that, to me, is what sanctification is about. <laughs> it's retraining your brain to think and be what God intended you to be in every way. So if you think of disrupting biological fallenness, some of us have genes, have biochemistry that makes us prone to break down in psychotic ways. We may be schizophrenic or bipolar with manic depression or rec have recurrent severe suicidal depressions. And medication can be life-saving and really helpful in those situations. I would say that's an example of us using medicine to push back against the fall just as we do with diabetes and cancer and all other forms of physical disorder. Exercise is the best self-help treatment for depression and anxiety. 
I always talk about exercise with people that I work with. I also talk about diet. I think pastors and, and, uh, and counselors need to be nutritionists, or at least to have an interest. Because helping people to be good stewards of their bodies, to care for themselves well, that is a spiritual activity. And you need to encourage people to eat well, to not drink too much alcohol or caffeine. Um, and, and also to be wise about how much they take on. Pastors are notorious for overloading themselves with multi -ta multiple tasks and get exhausted and depressed and burned out. So, and there are many other places we could talk about disrupting biological fallenness. And then disrupting demonic influence. Now this, this is obviously a category that non-Christians are not gonna deal in at all, although non-Christians will deal a lot. They understand the biological bit. They might not call it fallenness. But as Christians, we know that we are all caught up every day, every hour and minute of the day in spiritual warfare. The devil is real. The whole biblical framework gives us glimpses of that. So in helping people to put on the armor of God, to not give the devil a foothold where they are particularly weak, perhaps with sexual temptation or a temptation to covetousness or pride, um, and to use the, the full all the implements of the armor that are described in Ephesians 6. So I don't, I mean, I, I bring this in, I weave it in a little, little, a lot of these biblical themes, I'm not sitting there teaching people about these things. I'm gradually introducing in little ways, and we'll talk a bit more about this in a case study tomorrow. Um, one of my students said to me and when, he had been counseling for about, I don't know, six months or so. He said, after a particularly moving session with a client, he said, I feel like I'm holding this person's heart in my hand. And he commented on what a privilege it was to be in counseling, that people would trust you that much. And I was flying somewhere and I came across this advertisement in the flight magazine for a, a real heart institute. <laughs> It happened to be called Covenant Heart Institute. I thought, well, we have a counseling program at Covenant Seminary, and we do heart surgery. Maybe we should adopt this, this name. Some of you are old enough to have grown up with Second World War stories, as I did, um, <clears throat> born just after the Second World War. And you remember the stories maybe of mine layers dropping mines, but also dropping uh, depth charges that would explode, you know, uh, a half a mile down in the ocean at the level at which the submarines were, were going and would destroy the submarines that way. But it was a delayed discharge. And sometimes I think that the questions we need to ask are like depth charges. They go off later. <laughs> If you think of the, and, and, and we, the, the whole theme of questions, reflecting on a God who asks questions, it's an amazing experience to study from beginning to end of the Bible, to notice, for example, in Genesis, we begin right there. God says to Adam and Eve, where are you? Great question. That's the question we're asking everyone, isn't it? Where, where are you today? God knew where they were, they were hiding. But we often don't, we don't have God's omniscient knowledge, but we're asking people, reflect on what's going on in your heart. Where are you? And where is your brother? God knew where Cain's brother was, but he wanted him to look within and ask himself, what have I done? Why have I done it? He's, he's, do you, do you hear the disrupting element in this question? <clears throat> what are you doing here, Elijah? He knew what Elijah was doing, but Elijah, he'd fled, the, he'd f fled from the scene of the great victory on the, with the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. He'd been intimidated by Queen Jezebel. He runs 200 miles into the desert, hides, curls up in a cave, 
and God comes to him in that still, small voice, where are you, what are you doing here? And then he repeats the question, what are you doing here? With Jonah, similar, another suicidal saint who says it's better for me to be dead than to be in this situation. And, and, but he's furious, isn't he, with God, because God has sort of gone back on his plan to judge the people of Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't have the same mercy. He's still vengeful. And the book ends with Jonah still angry. It's almost left for us to say, okay, am I still angry? Am I, do I have unrighteous anger in my heart? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? That walk in the garden with Job. And we are not God, obviously, so we can't ask quite the same questions as God did. But the point is here, God knows, and very often we, we may intuitively guess where the person is struggling, but we ask questions to help them to see those things and come to those conclusions. Who among you will cast the first stone? Who is your neighbor, Jesus asks. So there's a real art in the, ask, the sort of questions and the timing of questions with people. <coughs> So on to the final, the sixth stage here of draw and direct. <clears throat> and there are many ways we could talk about this um, because, and they're all sort of biblical phrases that we're called to draw and direct people towards character traits of, and attributes of faith and hope and love and truth. Big words that we have to work out with what these mean for people in their lives. We're drawing them towards sorrow and grief over the damage that's been done to them by other people. Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus says. Mourn over their own sin, and I think also over the sins of the world. Towards a deeper understanding of God and themselves. Calvin says in the beginning of the Institutes that our knowledge of God and our knowledge of ourselves is intertwined together, and he's not quite sure which comes first. I think they, 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 they ne of necessity go together. Towards humanness and wholeness and holiness, the more you become who God intends you to be, the more human you become. And that means you are more whole you are more holy. <clears throat> you hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then all of this drawing and directing, we're, we're drawing people out of their own cynicism and hardness and sinful reactions to the way they have been sinned against to a place of kneeling before God in repentance and sorrow over their own sin working against their own sinfulness and fallen, fallenness in every area of life. <clears throat> and here, more biblical language from Paul in Romans of putting off the old nature and putting on the new. So part of our task in counseling is helping people to translate their experience into the biblical language and categories. Um, we can use both psychological and biblical categories, but we have to help people to relate those to each other. Towards loving God and our neighbor, and, um, sorry, let me go back there, towards loving God and our neighbor, which of course Jesus uses as a summary of so much else. <clears throat> so we're moving people from brokenness to beauty, from grief to glory, or God is using us to move them, from depravity to dignity, and the disintegration that we all experience internally or in our relationships, hopefully is being, that there is a process of reintegration. That's what our brains are being reintegrated. So we're drawing people, as we hear their story, we're helping to them to make the connection of how is this, how is your story part of God's bigger story? Where is he using you in his purposes in this world? And 
And it's helping people to move from stories of hurt and cynicism and betrayal and bitterness to places where they can begin to say, what is, how is God using my hurt, my experience of brokenness for others and for his kingdom now? How is he moving me away from idols and towards the true and living God? I'm almost done here, but a few more things. That, and in the process of counseling, obviously from the very beginning, we need to somehow be giving people hope, maybe just a glimmer of hope. Here's someone who I think is trustworthy and who is interested in my story and can help me to process it. That's, that gives them hope. Um, and as we do that, we obviously have to help them to be realistic about how much hope is possible in this life. And here we get into the great themes of what, what is for the now and what is for the not yet, the future kingdom, the future consummation of the kingdom. So someone who is manic depressive or bipolar will probably need medication all their life, or someone who is schizophrenic, someone who is chronically recurrently depressed, may need that. They may need counseling. They may never, may, may be only partially healed this side of glory. And so it's sort of working with them and getting a feel for how much you can, the change is possible. And often you don't know that for sure. But it is wonderful to be able to look ahead to, to share with them a vision of the reality of the glory that they are gathering that will one day be complete. So Paul talks about the suffering that we go through, that, and it's not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And we wait with eager expectation for that day. And, and sharing this story of how we're all in bondage to the fall, and we're not going to be completely liberated this side of glory. So we become good groaners alongside them and with them, pointing them towards it. We, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, and we wait for it patiently. So eagerly and patiently. That's part of the task of counseling, is cultivating eagerness and patience at the same time. So we, just to conclude here, we, one of the favorite passages of counselors, because it refers to the wonderful counselor, of course, is that we walk in the steps of that wonderful counselor in being called to preach the good news. And the good news is just not just that Christ died for your sins and you go to heaven when you die, it's much bigger. The good news is there is a God. There is a meaning to life. He has given us the scriptures as to, to help us to live this life, to know how we should live. And he is working in us to redeem us and to bring us one day to complete healing. So in that process, we are called to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom from, for captives who are captured by addictions, for example, um, to proclaim a day of justice coming. And for many people who have been abused, and, uh, and the abuser maybe has died or has never repented, um, this is an incredible comfort. Because we are called in our anger not to take justice into our own hands, but to leave justice in God's hands. But that means waiting patiently and eagerly for that day of justice to come. And then we're called to comfort all who mourn and grieve. And this wonderful exchange that Isaiah talks about, the crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Wonderful contrasts, aren't they? And, sorry, let me go back a second. And, and this is sort of like the, the grief to glory, the, the brokenness to beauty, the depravity to dignity, but these are the biblical, the biblical language here. 
And then the Isaiah intriguingly goes on to talk even with other images, and this image is of rebuilding glorious ruins, ancient ruins. So when that the kingdom of God comes, Jesus comes, he reads this passage in Isaiah. He doesn't read the whole thing, he stops halfway through, but it's pointing towards the day when God will completely rebuild, and we are in the process of restoring ruins, restoring places devastated for generations, families. You see families coming down with alcoholism, with abuse, generation after generation. And you see a family becoming Christians, and then the beginning of change and transformation, and goodness and good parenting going on down through the next generations. So that's one image. The other image Isaiah uses is oaks of righteousness. And I love to think of us as Christians as little acorns, little tender oak trees. But oaks are slow growing and strong, and they need the sap of the Spirit of God going up through them. And then they make a forest of oaks, which Isaiah says is for the display of God's splendor. So this work we are in of counseling, of pastoral counseling, is one of displaying something of the glory of God, giving people glimpses of redemption and restoration uh, in this world. So let me stop there. That's a sort of overview, a vision that I see of what my calling is as a Christian counselor. Uh, and I hope it gives you some hooks, maybe some Ds to hang. When I ask my students in counseling I, who are doing counseling, I say, when you're doing this counseling session, just think through and see if you can identify the different Ds, the different stages of this that you have used in your counseling with this person today.